Hi, I'm Dr. Wyatt Ramey, and I'm a complex spine and adult deformity surgeon at Houston Methodist. And today I'm going to be talking about adult spinal deformity and correction of a severe kyphoscoliosis deformity. So I'd like to begin by a short case presentation. Um, the history of this, of this patient, he's a 73-year-old male and he's a semi-retired rancher. He has many years of low back pain and buttock pain. And over the last three years or so, he's been unable to stand up straight. He has a baseline level of pain of about five, and by the end of the day, that gets up to about seven or even higher. He's failed many forms of conservative treatment, uh, such as PT, pain meds, pain management, chiropractor, etc. He's a fairly healthy individual. He doesn't have a significant past medical history. Uh, however, he is somebody that doesn't uh, present to the doctor very often. Um, and he does have a relatively recent repair of a unruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. He's currently not on any medications and he does have a uh, past social history of smoking a half pack per day, uh, which we did get him to seize. Uh, on his physical exam, he was full strength and has full sensation in all of his extremities. Uh, he has two plus reflexes in all of his extremities. And just cutting to the chase on his exam, on his uh, overall alignment in the office, he had very impressive positive sagittal balance, uh, which he heavily compensated for with pelvic retroversion. And even then he still wasn't able to fully uh, look you uh, straight in the eye and uh, uh, stand up straight. And uh, when lying him supine on the exam table, it did take him about 20 seconds or so to be flat, uh, but that was not without significant pain. So here's some of this patient's uh, uh, preoperative scoliosis x-rays uh, on the left. As you can see, that's the uh, lateral view. And there is significant loss of lumbar lordosis and uh, substantial positive sagittal balance just by, by eyeballing it. Uh, when we did measure these uh, preoperative pelvic parameters, his pelvic incidence was 40 degrees. His lumbar lordosis was negative 9, so he did have 9 degrees of lumbar kyphosis which gave him a PILL mismatch of about 49 degrees. And as I mentioned previously, uh, he was compensating uh, pretty significantly. So uh, therefore he has a high pelvic tilt of about 29 degrees. And again, his global sagittal alignment was very positive um, uh, of about 16 centimeters. Uh, so each of these lines in red, uh, the, the, the dashed line represents his global sagittal alignment and the uh, each of the uh, solid red lines represent his current lumbar lordosis and the yellow lines there indicate roughly where the optimal uh, alignment of each of those parameters should be. Uh, this was his preoperative MRI. Uh, I included this just to show that there wasn't any significant uh, lumbar central stenosis that was there and he did not have any significant leg symptoms other than his buttock pain of course. So I wanted to include what are some of my goals of deformity surgery as I go through each one of these types of cases. Uh, number one, I, I think of each case uh, first and foremost as correcting the sagittal and or coronal imbalance that's present. Uh, number two, uh, this is mostly done uh, via restoring lumbar lordosis uh, if there is a lack thereof. Um, and you have to provide a very solid caudal fixation because of the uh, biomechanical forces that are at the uh, uh, caudal end of your construct. Uh, you always want to provide some type of bolster to your construct and uh, think about um, ways that your hardware can fail in the future. And you always want to also think about proximal junctional kyphosis prevention uh, since that is one of the most feared complications of this type of surgery. And of course, ultimately, you want to diminish the pain and increase function of each of these patients as they present to you. So when I apply each of these goals to this particular patient, um, I want to correct the, the sagittal imbalance that's present uh, in this gentleman. And that's done, like I mentioned, by restoration of lumbar lordosis. So how did I do that? Well, in this particular case, I did so uh, by starting anteriorly, by performing an L4-5 and L5-S1 A lift. Um, and then subsequently, I performed an L2-3 T-lift, uh, or an aggressive T-lift that I uh, have referred to and was trained to do uh, via the intradiscal osteotomy. Um, 
again, that solid caudal fixation. I did uh, perform that with bilateral pelvic bolts. And uh, hardware, hardware failure or rod fracture prevention. Uh, this was done in this case mainly by inserting those large A-lift cages and using uh, cobalt chrome rods. Each of those techniques has been shown to produce any caudal rod fracture um, uh, in this population. And as far as preventing proximal junctional kyphosis in this case, uh, that was done via vertebroplasties at UIV and UIV plus one. So that in this case would be T9 and T10. And uh, another technique I've, I've adopted relatively recently is I use MIS percutaneous screws at the superior aspect of my construct just to not disrupt any of those uh, uh, posterior uh, ligamentous complexes of the spine and keep the muscul musculature intact. Uh, so again, all of this was done um, via a, a two-stage approach. Um, my first stage was done on a Tuesday and the second was done on a Thursday. So as I mentioned, stage one was done, um, uh, or I, I performed an L4 to S1 A lift. In stage two, I performed a T10 to pelvis instrumentation infusion, as well as L2 to L4 Smith-Peterson osteotomies and L2-3 aggressive T lift, or again, intradiscal osteotomy. And I performed, as I mentioned, the T9, T10 vertebroplasties as a means of proximal junctional kyphosis prevention. So here are the surgery results from, from, this, patient's, uh, from this patient as far as um, uh, radiographically. Uh, so in that middle image, uh, that's the, lateral the new lateral scoliosis x-ray. Um, and there was significant restoration of that lumbar lordosis. So he now has uh, 36 degrees of lumbar lordosis for a PILL mismatch of four, um, which I was very happy about uh, in this patient. His new global sagittal alignment is about four centimeters. Um, and for a gentleman his age of about 73, uh, I think that's totally age appropriate um, and desirable. Um, his pelvic tilt did come down as a result, and I imagine that might uh, slowly uh, come down over time as he adjusts to his, uh, to his new position there. And we were also able to achieve a little bit of a uh, uh, slight coronal imbalance um, correction as well. So the total length of stay for this gentleman was, was nine days. He spent two days in the ICU following uh, stage two. Uh, he did have a, a relatively mild complication of an instant thrombus that was uh, uh, picked up by our vascular approach surgeon. Um, again, as I mentioned, he had the recent uh, uh, stent repair of the AAA, unruptured AAA. Um, and vascular performed a thrombectomy uh, after his ALIF, and that was done relatively non-emergently. Um, after, after being in the ICU for a couple of days, this patient was up and walking with a walker. He was neurologically intact. He had, of course, the expected surgical pain, um, and he was discharged to inpatient rehab after nine days. Uh, I did see this patient six weeks, uh, just recently, actually, I'm in the office. He's doing very, very well. Um, his pre-op back pain has resolved, but of course he still has that um, uh, significant surgical pain as you'd expect. But he is able to walk and stand for much longer distances now. Um, and of course he remains neurologically intact. And the thing that he's most happy about is he's able to have conversations uh, with looking people in the eye. So some of the, the pearls of deformity surgery that I've uh, picked up through my training um, and through, through experience, you have to have a systematic plan in the system uh, for approaching uh, each of these cases. They're very complex um, and there's a lot of uh, angles and planning um, and potential uh, pitfalls that, that you must avoid. So again, having that systematic approach goes a long way. And one of the things that I was taught by, by one of my mentors is that uh, it's more than just a long fusion. It's more than just a T lift, a long T lift. You always have to have those parameters in mind, and you always have to think of those potential complications, such as PJK and rod fracture down the line. Um, constant intraop communication with anesthesia is key. You don't want to get behind in resuscitating these patients intraoperatively. Extensive pre-op counseling and optimization goes a long, long way. Um, in, pre in preventing complications uh, perioperatively. I rarely operate uh, uh, or, or sign these patients up for surgery uh, after their first clinic visit, after their first clinic visit, and I often send them for prehab just to get them in as best shape as possible. 
And one of the ways that I um, uh, will, will improve lumbar lordosis or, or gain maximal lordosis is I'll, is I'll often um, uh, think of these cases by pulling the spine into my rod or into the rods, um, and that's done so via cantilever reduction with reduction towers. And you have to uh, think of these patients uh, while they're in the hospital via a multidisciplinary approach, and that includes ICU, anesthesia, internal medicine, PT, your approach surgeon, et cetera. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope each of you learned something.